I determined a long time ago that I was going to uh, enjoy what I did working. I was going to enjoy where I lived. I didn't leave a lot of chances for, uh, for doing that. I mean, I had to pick just the right profession. I was lucky. Blacksmithing fits that perfectly because I have the freedom first of being self-employed. I have the freedom to live a lifestyle I appreciate a lot, which is a simple lifestyle without a lot of luxuries, a lot of accoutrements. I mean, I drive a car and all that, you know, we have running water, but uh, uh, <laughs> that's, that's not what I'm trying to get away from. I'm trying to get away from the, the complexities of life. I'm not real good at handling them. Here, I can kind of construct my own little world. This is really ideal for me. It's small acreage. I'm not a farmer. I don't know much about farming from the city. But I'm protected. I don't have any immediate neighbors. I'm not apt to in the way we're situated. There's a creek down there that is always great to go in after a day of blacksmithing, 100 degree heat. You can run down there and jump into the cold water. It revives you kind of. There's a place for Peggy to garden and for her to have her goats to wander. And uh, we feel kind of isolated here. We're only four miles from Westfield, but you feel like you're in the middle of the Adirondacks or something, which is, that's what my real uh, interest is here, is being alone. Left alone, I want to be left alone. <laughs> now, Mitch, were you actually going to show us the construction of the, the uh, Ram's Head poker? Yep. Yep, that's what you'll see. We're we working with iron here? No, we're actually working with hot roll steel. And uh, the first step that we're going to do is the most crucial in the whole piece. The success of the whole piece depends on, on this part working. And that is that we're going to weld these horns directly to this shank, which I'm holding on to, to make them one piece of steel at the very end. And that's where the face will be formed and all the features will occur. This is just borax hand salt, but it works to form a protective coating all the way around the area that I'm going to weld, which will keep oxygen from entering the weld. Now, oxygen entering the weld will make the weld fail, so I think rhythm is important in the work. The rhythm in your hammer blows is what gives you your ease of work and speed in executing it. I've been developing kind of a hammer technique that no matter what problem I take on, it's something that I've, you know, the technique I have established does all the work for me while my mind is working on the design as I'm working it out in the iron. And once you have that uh, rhythm established, you know, you can turn the metal any direction you want, the hammer keeps hitting it, and you can redirect the hammer any place you want. And the forge well has a unique ability of being a solid piece of steel now. We're not dealing with two pieces packed together or glued together. This is one solid piece, which is the requirement we need for making the face on the end of this poker. So what's going to happen now, Mitch? The next thing we're going to get into is trimming off the end of this with a hacksaw to give us a contour that I need for the face. And then we'll start to punch the nose. That'll be the first feature that we work on. This kind of blacksmithing is not a terrific amount of brute strength required because the work is small. Now, the only way you can affect this is to get these nostrils the way you want them. It's just by experience, knowing which way to drive the, pump, uh, the punch. And all you can do is start by making a lot of mistakes. If I had to do uh, sculptural pieces each day, I think I'd become very bored quickly. Uh, the, 
the challenge of the sculptural piece is so great that it's a relief to have a farmer come in with uh, a trailer hitch and he's straightened out. <laughs> Uh, so it, make, it makes a nice diversity for me and keeps me a little more balanced in my work. And it gives me time to think about the artwork while I'm working on something else. It, well, that looks, that looks pretty good. Right? Uh, we'll go ahead with the mouth now. Now we'll get this here. These begin to take on a personality, you know, that, that you really can <laughs> with any way that you make them. How far to open them out, all these little decision things that uh, affect the final product. That one there, I like to tweak open a little more than usual. Okay, now. have a hand tool you don't have to worry about keeping up with the darn thing it has to keep up with you and you set the pace and that may seem like a small difference to most people but it's not when you get used to using hand tools you begin to well you just begin to slow down a little bit and that's always been my interest now that we've got the horns welded on and the face is formed the next major step is going to be bending the neck, which is going to be, mean bringing the head around 180 degrees, almost 180 degrees. I like metal because you see results fast. The character of the metal is such that you have to work with it fast because it's only hot for a very short period of time. Um, and so everything about it has to happen one step right after the other. And before you know it, the piece is all finished, or the piece you're working on has uh, is a finished part of a larger piece. And boom, there it is. You can see your mistakes right away. You can see your accomplishments right away. heard about a course at Cooperstown, New York. It's a seminar, just a week long, where you can take blacksmithing and uh, cabinet work and all sorts of different things. Peggy, my wife, she took, she took uh, kitchen arts to the 17th century. And uh, I took blacksmithing, obviously. And uh, from that, decided this is what I was interested in doing. So actually, after I got out of Cooperstown and did finally get a shop put together later that summer, I started looking at early American design. I'm not a designer. I'm not trained in design or anything, and so it was really difficult just to start. It was hard to know what to make, uh, actually. So I decided I'd start with the early American design. That would give me a basis to work from. And uh, then slowly, as I began to understand the rudiments of designing the ironwork and estimating stock length and uh, which step to do next, that's when I started getting more toward the European style of work, which uh, carries a lot more ornament with it and does a lot more interesting to look at. That first summer started out real well. Didn't sell a lot of things, but made a lot of contacts, met a lot of people, and uh, was re trying to refine my basic technique, which was really crude. Then in the third year, I decided this was time to really break away from a part-time job and uh, really make it a full-time endeavor. And I borrowed a little money and bought a bunch of coal and some steel and started hammering away out here. And during the course of that year, I found that the volume things really <clears throat> weren't going to pay like custom order if the special custom orders were plentiful enough, and that's what I had to find out. So I pursued that aspect of it and encouraged it when people came out and were asking questions. I always tried to offer to help design something for them or something that would really suit their needs in particular. And people liked it. They liked me providing that service. So 
now that's the way things have gone in a very you know definite beeline. When you put the oil on a hot piece like this, it's three or four hundred degrees, and it sticks to the outer surface of the metal. Just like if you were seasoning a cast iron frying pan. It's the same principle. You could use vegetable oil, motor oil. I use linseed oil because it has the least obnoxious smell. This is a four pound hammer we're using here. This isn't all that handy to use, but it's a People have, indeed, in this area particularly, gotten more interested in it as I produced it. The first show I ever did in Westfield, most people weren't aware of what I was doing and were looking for the horse. They thought I should be showing horses. Well, I try to dispel that theory right away. And it's working, but it's working so fast I wasn't able to keep up with it. Actually, you don't see your development until you've seen something you made about a year ago. And you look at it and you go, oh, my God, did I make that? And there honestly have been pieces when I've been shocked to think that I'd actually made that. That's when you see your development. Uh, and makes you realize that you're always changing. If you pick any one particular time when you're working, you think, boy, I'm doing this as great as I can. But you look at that a month later and you think, boy, I'm doing it better now. What's it going to be like next month? And that's how the development, you know, goes with any craftsman for Pete's sake.